welcome to the BNP Boxing Now podcast. I am your host, that dude named Dave, aka DJ. And to my left, but he is my right hand man as always. Jorge, what is going on? Uh, it's been a busy weekend and stuff with the uh, domino show that I'm working on on the side, and plus all the stuff we've been working on with this boxing show. So, yeah, it's uh, so it's good to get back here on uh, on a Sunday on time <laughs> for the live stream, which is something we want to get unscheduled moving forward. Uh, right now it's almost nine o'clock central time, so I think we're okay so far. Yeah, it's good to see you, man. Glad to have you back in the in the dungeon studio. Nice looking dungeon. Yeah, you're not bad. Let's get the particulars out the way before I start uh, cracking on you here, before some jokes here. So, sure. as always, on YouTube, if you're checking us out here, click on like, subscribe, click on the bell notification. And we're also streaming live, as you can see here. So, if you don't catch us, you can always come back on the replay here. Same thing with Twitch, uh, Boxing Now. We're streaming live on there as well. So, those are the two destinations. Uh, Spotify, if that's your choice, click on follow for Boxing Now podcast. And also, shout out to our affiliates, Spinger Sports World. On the Zingo app, channel 250. Once again, we're on Spanglish Sports World, channel 250, on the Zingo app in Canada. So shout out to our affiliates over there. So that's what's up here. Ah, we're recording this live on March 7th, Jorge. And what I wanted to talk about really fast here is that we've come across here an anniversary date. Because tomorrow, March 8th, is the 50th anniversary of the fight of the century between Muhammad Ali and Joe Frazier. And... I can't believe like as many times I've watched the fight and seeing clips and, you know, Muhammad Ali, just Muhammad Ali being Muhammad Ali and Joe Frazier mm. and how this fight still resonates to this day. There are so many factors that occurred like that fight changed boxing. Mm. You know, the things that impacted Ali, the things that impacted Joe Frazier, you know, they needed each other as much as as much as Ali is the GOAT. We recognize him as the greatest fighter of all time. Got him right here. Make sure before I started a boxing podcast that, nope, Ali's got to be on the wall here to represent. And, you know, these two guys represent so much in the sport. They did so much for it. And I just want to talk on this for a second here. And I want to give some some things for people. If you have not watched this fight or if you just know, you know, just the two fights, you know, of Ali 2 and then the Thriller of Manila, things of that nature. There's a documentary called Ali Frazier 1, One Nation Divisible. Oh, God, Jorge. It's such a dope documentary. Oh, my God. I've watched it. I think it came out like 20 years ago. And it breaks down the society breakdown of Ali and Frazier. The irony of the fight is the fact that this was the best of them and the worst of each other. You know, um, let me get your thoughts on the fight really fast before I get um, into it. Like, I mean, from a boxer standpoint, I know you've seen the fight. You know, how did you feel? They're like. You know, are you are you a Joe Frazier guy? Are you an Ali guy with the with the banter going back and forth? I'm just kind of curious how you felt about the fight. The fight itself was, you know, and this is more like as a young kid growing up. I I think I've seen the fight like once or twice, and 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 like I say, and when I say once or twice, never the full 15 rounds because I, you know when you're a kid you only sit see the bits and pieces that were available to you at the time and stuff. So I definitely need to go back and rewatch it as one entire fight. Mm-hmm. uninterrupted and without commercials and just kind of get a feel for it <laughs> with that said it's the fight of the century for a reason because those two had two giant personalities that uh clash with each other and they made it known <laughs> before the fight even started i mean there's a reason why i went to three fights is because it's after the first fight it wasn't enough they needed each other again 30 i mean 30 plus rounds, almost 40 rounds. I take that back. Uh, 40 plus rounds. I got to look up the exact rounds because uh, the fight was stopped in the 15 round thing for the third <laughs> one. And this is the, during the time I had just had a brain fire. I'm sorry, folks. This were 15 round fights. We're in 12 round fights now. And some, fights you know, then. I mean, nowadays you have 10 round fights. The championship fights are 12 rounds. Back then they were 15, you know. So can you imagine these guys fighting 15 rounds nowadays? Um, It's funny. I think... <laughs> <laughs> I, could probably, I think I think if we actually had to think, we think about maybe the last fifteen years, twenty years of boxing we've watched. Mm-hmm. I probably had to say maybe on two hands, I could probably think of two fights, a couple, several fights that I wish had gone three more rounds. What's that? Oh, the Fury fight with Wilder, the first one. Oh yeah, the, no, more, I, re- I, recent I, history. I didn't think about recent history. Yeah, three more the, rounds easily. I, I, I love that one. Yeah, because that was a twelfth round when, like we know, uh, Wilder got the knockdown, but. 
to Fury to come up with that jaw. And imagine what could happen in, in round. Yeah. Did Fury round has thirteen? Two, could yeah. Fury do it? Yes, yeah, thirteen. That's a that's a good point there. What else you got? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think there's other fights even before that. I mean, I check that I, as much as would Trinidad De La Hoya be different if De La Hoya didn't run those last four rounds? If we ever got a rematch, because like I said, Ali Frazier went three times. Like fighters like this, two Hall of Famers. Like we know these are the best in the heavyweight history. Tito and Oscar at the time, you could say like their past were they're considered the greatest in history. And mm-hmm. you know, like people hate Oscar, but his personal demons, but he's he's a hell of a fighter. We oh, can't, no, no, we, I can't mean, we can't I just want to make sure that I say this when people you know listen and talk because I've been in barbershops and people disrespect fighters all the time, right? I just want to say on the record that as much as we talk trash about certain guys or about you know things that they have done to hurt themselves, but in the ring, Oscar was a beast. Oh yeah, no, we always yeah. respect. So I just want to make sure I have that on on camera. That's no, all. No, we always respect the fighters. Mm-hmm. We always we we can complain and run and and disagree and have an opinion on how things are being done in their career and stuff like that. Though, but in terms of the actual sport itself, that's I mean, I mean, at the end of the day, my hats off to you. That's that's a profession. That's a business you've chosen. That's a profession. Mm-hmm. I re- and I respect you guys for taking that profession. You know, but on my end of it, I'm going to cover it as a fan. And as an observer, and provide my opinions and thoughts about it, though. But at the end of the day, it doesn't. I'll never disrespect the fighter and say, you know, that what he's doing is, you know, that he's being disingenuous with the sport itself. Right? Mm-hmm. He's in. He's in boxing. He's taking licks. He's giving licks. That's essentially what you're doing there. And it's, um, you know, my head's up to him. Let me just give a little uh, background for people. Um, we're not gonna go in depth to this fight here. What I'm gonna do though is down the line, we're gonna do a rewatchable. For this fight yeah and get into the details of this because it's actually such an action-packed fight and it's so enjoyable to watch it still resonates this day even 50 years later one of the things that we can do kind of compare like what we're seeing with anthony joshua and um and fury like you literally have two guys here one who has the belts and the other one who's a linear champion mm-hmm. ali as we know history is documented don't need to do revisions here that he was the man he was the champion no one could beat him he was on top of his game and then as we know Several factors within the U.S. government took away the fans, the boxing public, the world of the greatest of the greatest fighter at the time in his prime. You know, literally, when you look at the situation with Ali, it was retribution or payback because of the fact that he became a uh, became a, a Muslim, mm-hmm. Nation of Islam. His best friend at the time was Muhammad, I mean uh, Malcolm X, who converted him. We know that the FBI was wiretapping and was investigating, looking at the Nation of Islam and Muslims in general, including. Um, Martin Luther King Jr., as well as other black activists. Anybody else a black activist was a target. And so that's what happened with Ali. The thing with Ali, though, he was a bigger target because he was the champion of the world. And when you had J. Edgar Hoover, who was doing these things behind the scenes, and then we're seeing now resonate today that main thing that I wanted to mention is that, you know, when we bring up Malcolm X, is that the Nisha Islam didn't kill him. The FBI did. And reason why we know that now, because it's coming out now. You know, and when you see that how Malcolm X was murdered by the government, it's easy to see how the government took away Ali's license. The government went after the boxing council and basically said, if you're not going to the military, take away his license. And Ali stuck to his religious guns and said, no, I did Viet, no Viet Cong. And this is a, I love this quote. No Viet Cong has ever called me nigger. But no, though, in this country, that's happened to him. Lost count. And he stuck to his guns and he lost his prime. You know, he came back. We know I'm getting to it in a second, but can you think about what would you do, Jorge, if you were in the heart of your career and then for three years you couldn't work? Uh, that's tough, man. Ain't no, it? I self even just for one year because I I can recall that in my personal life and stuff with my own career and stuff. So, uh, yeah, no, I mean, and in my my case, it would be a new father, still mm-hmm. a young husband, and uh, yeah, from you're out of work for nine months or something, or close to a year, it's uh. It sucks. So I can imagine for three years, it just drives you crazy, right? Yeah. I, I mean, I mean, I would understand. I mean, you're trying to provide a living and stuff. That's what you, I mean, and it's I even mean. worse too when you think about, you know, we've seen the movie Ali of Will Smith. You get a, you get snippets of it, but you saw the part where that when he stopped fighting and the poverty line kicked in for him. You sure. know, you're living this high lifestyle because you're a champion of the world. The spoils are all too. You know, like you look at any athlete, whether you're past, present, making millions, big house, entourage. People adore you. You're on TV all the time. Mm. And then out of nowhere, you know, but not out of nowhere, but you know, when the situation happens and then you like in the movie, you know, he's on the train and so it's like, Hey champion, he's not trying to you know be recognized because the shame, 
you know, like the shame or pride and knowing everything that's going on with you. And you're just like, man, you bury your head. Could you imagine being the top guy? And then you just want to shrink into a corner, man. That's that is some mental stuff for you to go through. What Ali went through those three plus years. Yeah, he put himself in a shell there, and and, and I get it. I completely understand why. I mean, I, it's hard to put yourself in that a person's shoes and try to think would I be that that person as well too. Mm -hmm. But if you have understood unemployment or been unemployed long enough, <laughs> close to a year. And and you care about working, you care about providing mm -hmm. for your family and your kids. You you almost do it to yourself as almost just happenstance. You just end up you, you're not happy with who you are as a person because you're not able to provide. Yeah. You know, and in this case, you know, I mean, I have a young I had a young kid, you know, young baby at the time, and I was like, you know, he didn't get it, but I I certainly was feeling the pressure of not being able to do anything for them. Mm -hmm. So let me get into the fight here real fast, and then we'll move on here. But at the time, Frazier had the WBC and WBA belt, mm. and he was 26 and 0 with 23 KOs, undefeated champion. Same thing with Ali. He was, uh, let's see here, he was 31 and 0 with 25 KOs. You know, so I can only imagine us being boxing fans and knowing we, you know, people who are Ali fans, people who are Frazier fans, you have two undefeated fighters, and then people who believe one's a champion, because Ali's the linear champion. He his situation as we talk about with Fury and how he lost his belts, but his was stripped from him. Yep. He couldn't fight because they wouldn't let him fight. So when he came back, he never he was the linear champion. And then you have Frazier who just picked, cleaned up all the pieces and just destroyed everybody before he got the Ali fight. You mm -hmm. know, so you literally have the situation not like Anthony and it seems like Anthony Joshua and Fury. You know, but literally two undefeated champions in their prime under thirty years old. You know, we don't see that. We don't see two undefeated champions under 30 fight nowadays in the heavyweight division. You know, so also I um, want to bring out, too, is that when Ali fought Frazier, people think that he's went straight to the Frazier fight. No, he actually had a couple of things that line up here. Uh, he fought Jerry Quarry. Mm -hmm. Now, I just want to point this out here for any fight fan or any uh, boxer or following whatever like that for him to be off that many years and to go into a fight with Jerry Quarry is crazy. Jerry Corey was 37 and four at the time. The heavyweight division was murderous roles, considered the greatest era in heavyweight history during that late 60s, early 70s phase, where you literally had 10 to 15 guys who could be champion any time now. You know, I mean, man, Ernie Shavers could knock the lights out of anybody today. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. He just, he only had like two belts back then, one and two belts, you know? So for him to go to the Corey fight, and then he had a second fight too. Let me uh pull that up here really fast. Uh, He actually... Uh, da, 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 da. I am sorry that I didn't have it here. Uh, da, 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 da. Dang it. I lost my notes here. He had a second fight and that actually I do have it here. It's as Oscar uh, Benavina. Yep. And that was a 15 round TKO. That was like, oh my God, that was a bad fight. You know, it was like, oh, he got it out the way. And then he got the, he got the title five of Frazier went 15 rounds. And then I just want to pull up my notes here really fast that I, um, going to the 15th round, Frazier was ahead seven, six, one. 10-4 and 8-6. That's some, some weird uh, scoring because he got 15 rounds. 15 rounds, exactly. <laughs> so, and what I want to do really fast here, if you're watching this on YouTube or I'm streaming on Twitch here, I'm just going to play the actual knockout, knockdown in the 15th round where Frazier got him with the left hook. One thing that is missed in history, Jorge, is that Joe Frazier, he, he like I said, I, it brought the best and worst out of each other. Frazier was painted by Ali as an Uncle Tom. And the problem with that is that he's not an Uncle Tom. Joe Frazier, if you did his homework, was one of the most pro-black men you could find. Mm -hmm. You know, of course, he's about his business. He's one of the few fighters you could actually find out that they he was actually his own corporation. Like, these people invested into him. So he was actually a, a, a brand, and he didn't have any money. So this was like the first branding where people put money into him, and he was like a stock. So sure. that's how he maintained himself in his fight. Like people were investing in him, and he was winning. So he was a business, but he wasn't an Uncle Tom. He was not something that didn't fight for black rights. Mm. And then on the opposite, in Ali, he had a problem because he kept calling him Cassius. You know, we know that Ali was strong in his faith. That's not my name. That's my slave name. Leave that alone. So you literally had him calling him gorilla and monkey, and they going back and forth, and they was the worst of each other. And so one thing about Frazier, though, because he could say he lost the uh, he won the fight but lost the war because Ali is considered the greatest. And Joe Frazier, even though we know he's one of the greatest fighters of all time, we don't look at him in that same reverence. But his left hook, Jorge, yep. 
Man, that is classic. You know, when you talk about left hooks, people study Frazier's left hook to this day right now. Yeah. Let me just put this on here really sure, fast yeah. here. I'm doing some testing here, people. So uh, I've never done a an video and video on our on our show before. So let me go ahead and put this on here. And I'm going to go ahead and I just want you guys to see this here. Share screen. And then boom. And then here we go. Kind of like technology nowadays, Jorge. It's a wonderful thing. Oh, yeah. So I don't have no volume on because I don't want YouTube to get, get on me here. But, you know, this is the 15th round here, and Ali's on the ropes here. And you see Frazier just land a nasty left hook here, right? And it snapped Ali's back. And you can tell in this 15th round, they're both sucking gas. They're going at it. And this is what Frazier did. He leaned on you. He wasn't a heavy heavyweight like we see nowadays. We saw he put his chin on his yep. shoulder and leaned on, trying to put any kind of pressure. Classic fight in here. And so you see Ali trying to use his jab, pumping the straight, coming back and forth. But what is Frazier doing? He's leaning on it. He wants to get inside. Why? Because that hook, he just missed it right there, right? So here it is. Ali wants the distance. Once again, he's coming back. This is action pack. Look, left hook. Bam. Ali's jaw taking it, but here it is. Frazier wants to get in the middle mm -hmm. and just collapse. Like he doesn't want that space. Ali is perfect from the distance, right? Yep. Frazier is inside. Perfect styles match, right, Jorge? Yep, exactly. Yeah, um, that's get, why we had three fights of this, you know? Trying to get inside his arm length and stuff, and I let him use his, the, the, the length to, to his advantage. And that, 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 that's typically, I mean, basically, what you're seeing is kind of what you would want to you'd expect from Joshua or anybody going against a guy like Fury is. Gotta get inside. The thing is with Fury is that he's a good fighter inside as well. So yeah, it's, that's gonna be interesting when we see those two uh lock it up in the ring and stuff. But I mean, I'm watching him now, I'm watching the 15th round, and I'm like, okay, this is pretty much what I'm looking forward to when Fury and Joshua gets it. This should be actually this was too. the 14th round. I Fourth apologize round. here. Yeah, but I just wanted to show this clip here. Like you saw that that was 15 round end. I'm sorry, I missed the knockdown here, but I just want to see how their styles clash and conflict there, but they were the perfect style for each other. You know, so I'm gonna take that down here now. So, you know, the knockdown was the deciding factor, and you know, they had two more fights, and we're gonna come back to this. I just wanted to bring this up because it's the 50th anniversary, and there are so many issues with this fight, right? You have the socio-political issues, you have the government issues, you have the box standpoint, of the two top fighters at, mm -hmm. at, at at their time here right now. You just have a uh, nation in peril because of the Vietnam War. You have all these things going on. Then you have two black men who are fighting against each other who are literally saying nasty things about each other that's not even true. Mm -hmm. That divide that's dividing a country as well. You literally have people who were pro-black on the Ali side and people who thought that you know Frazier for the government or you were anti-black or you were racist, you were for Joe Frazier. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And he, it's just so funny how you had these two dichotomies come about and how it divided the country and in a sense it kind of brought the country but major divisions as well. That's why I brought that documentary that everybody should check out. It's so good. I think it's HBO did it as well. When HBO does documentaries, mm -hmm. they kill. Yeah. So I'm going to leave that here now. Uh, we're going to come back to that. Sure. But that, you know, March 8th, 50 years, you know, you don't see fights on Mondays. It's like the fight actually happened on a Monday before we end out here. Like the actual live fight happened on Monday. The anniversary is here on a Monday. Most fights happen on a Saturday. That just tell you how different times were back then. Closed circuit. And you, when you see the pictures, they were show stopping. People was ready for that fight on a Monday night, bro. And I actually kind of like the, now that you think about it, I kind of like the idea of watching boxing on Mondays as well. And, and hear me out on this one, right? Okay. So, so go you, go to, you go to work. He's had an eight-hour day and stuff, maybe ten hours, and usually Mondays, you know, is the beginning of the week and stuff. You're not, you're not expecting anything exciting to happen and stuff. That is a great way to start a week, right? I mean, if you're not watching Monday Night Football, which was a little bit later on, Monday Night Fights and a really good fight. Oh, you're setting up my whole week. You're setting up the table discussion, the the, the whole. And I, I mean, there was a water coolers back then. I would. I would I think they might have something of some type, but I mean, I don't think it was Hinkley Schmidt back then, but it was like, hey, you know, you gave me something to talk about at work for the next four days into the weekend. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, I, I actually wouldn't mind uh, the, the boxing world exploring that again, because I mean, you I, know what, though? As I think about that's not a bad idea, Jorge, because you could own the night. Like Saturday nights, you know, unless you properly plan, like we know, we're going to get into it later, like the month of May every year is a hot bed, right? So if you know you have a weekend that's tied to you, but Monday nights is normally nowadays just primetime TV shows that you're trying to catch. Like, you know, from so, a sports point of view, you can own the night. You, I mean, you can except, for, except for football season with Monday night football. Yeah. But even then, if you had a bad matchup game, because the schedules come out early for football, and let's say, for instance, you have a game where that one team is like 
five and like you know seven and the other team is like you know six and nine or whatever when like four and four and you know four and five going to the match or whatever the case may be like i don't want to see the oakland raiders and under 500 against you know the rams maybe they're under 500 nah this is not a good matchup and you could own a night if you put more primetime fights on the nights, like Mondays or Thursday nights. Actually, I kind of like the idea. So, like the the opening Monday nights where they're doing the doubleheader, I actually do like the doubleheader Monday night opening weekend because mm-hmm. that you're gonna usually get the West Coast games over there. And I actually don't mind those West Coast games because I mean Kansas City. I mean that place is like rocking like a college stadium anyway. So you you seen the screen shake in the middle of the night, you know? Yeah. Play a lot. So it's kind of cool to watch this though, especially watching them against the Raiders or the Broncos or the, or the Chargers. I mean, so it's gonna be good. But I would say if you wanted to do something the following Sunday, Mondays after that, where you throw in a fight, uh, like a small undercard, maybe a one fight or two fights, small undercard prospects and stuff, leading up to some major fight that leads you into Monday Night Football. Oh, hell yeah. You've set mm-hmm. me up from like 6 p.m. all the way to the end of the – you've got me locked down. I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to get home from work, shower, dinner, mm-hmm. and, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm glued to the two for the next five hours. Hell yeah. That's I don't I, at the end of the day, if you think about it from a business point of view, and I hope you guys in the boxing world are listening, Saturdays are crowded. You got yeah. UFC fights you're going out go up against basketball, baseball. You want to just regular life. I want to kick it. Exactly. You know, especially when we get done with COVID and the lockdown's over, because as soon as we get a vaccine or everybody we we had 80% herd immunity, whatever the case may be. You might lose pe- some casual fodder you, Saturday. People night. gonna be on planes. I don't care. People gonna be flying to like hole in the wall spot just to go somewhere. Exactly. And you there's gonna be a lot of Saturdays where there's gonna be programming on and no one's gonna be watching. Exactly. So I would definitely explore doing something <laughs> in the I mean, so week. You might be watching because you're coming home, you're coming back from your whole summer tired as hell, maybe, but but we want you want we want to catch me for the rest of the week. Mm-hmm. Do, do me something Monday night. Monday night, you got me sold. I, I, I'll be watching it Monday because it'll be a good fight to cover and something to talk about for the rest of the week as well. Mm-hmm. Change That's the whole, change, change the landscape. That's not a bad idea, man. Hmm. Hey, people, boxing guys, Bob Aram, top rank, the zone. You know. Uh, uh, Al Heyman. We got idea, we, we got ideas. Hey, man. hey we, I, I, we see fights in the week, but the fights in the week. You're, you're not putting the no budget guys on it. You're putting the guys that no one knows about. If you're gonna do that, put the young hot prospects that we want to get up for. You know, if you're not gonna do them on, you know, during the week, if you can't put them on Saturday nights, there's real estate during the week for boxing that people will watch. Yeah, you don't have to follow the path of the model for anybody else is doing. You can do your own thing, and I'll be there with you guys. Hey, hey, hey. So with that here, I gotta do this. <laughs> gonna time out of that discussion here. Now, uh, we got a new ad. Oh, we we're gonna sponsor. Yeah, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna lighten the mood up here. We're gonna take a quick sponsor break here. Uh, you know, I do another show, uh, Jump Off Live, and you know they we've got sponsors on the show, and so since uh, we're doing the box now, they say, hey, let's do the synergy here and let's all collaborate. And I'm like, yo, you're gonna cut the check? Come on through. So this is our new sponsor, and uh, I hope you guys check it like it here. So here it comes. Quarantine. Superstore. Our shelves stay stocked with all the things you don't need. We've got everything everyone else doesn't have from DVD rewinders, underarm do rags to relax and lay down that kinky armpit hair, burger buns, all top buns and no bottoms to double down on that soft bike cushion, pickle juice, juice, ooh wee, sweet and tangy, Donald Trump's UV ray disinfecting bleach water that heats up and attacks the virus inside the body. We sell pre-scrambled eggs. All you have to do is heat it up and eat it up. Mmm, good. Pink shrink to make your manhood get little when you know you shouldn't do it. Match lighters for those times you are having a hard time lighting that match to start a fire. Ice slicers. Candoms, the type of protection you apply for the things you can do. We keep it stocked, folks. Wolf wine and honey badger brew. Vulture jerky. The kind that's extra dry and will get you kind of high. Dead batteries. We've got all sizes. You can use them as paperweights and watch them roll away. Clear curtains so you can see out while people are looking in. And introducing human cheese, also known as Hugh Cheese, made from real breast milk. Quarantine Superstore. Sponsored by $1 billion in CARES Act Right Funds. Thanks, Uncle Sam. Hurry while supplies last, and they will, because not too many people buy these things. We Liddy, jump off. 
great sponsors, <laughs> man. I was definitely looking forward to seeing one store near <laughs> us in Chicago and maybe here out here in Aurora. Man, uh, yeah, I thought this was perfect for us to land this because we're still in quarantine. Just because the sun is out, people, we still quarantine. We still got the issue here. And so, um, but that pickle juice juice, I don't know, man. Uh, I, I could see that sort of being somewhere near like Maxwell Street down there, like Roosevelt and 290 or something like that. <laughs> get, you, get, you, get your pork chop sandwich and stuff by the corn. Oh, great. man, I haven't had a pork chop sandwich in so long, man. Especially their pork chop sandwich. Oh, the swine, especially the one on Independence off 290. Yes, exactly. Oh, my God, a pork chop sandwich. Give me a cheeseburger of extra grilled onions and let me get a grape soda, grape pop. No grape name drink, brand. Great drink. Great drink. Great drink. Oh, it comes with free, uh, like greasy, soiled cholesterol heaven French fries. And not to mention the polishes. Oh, God. See, people, if you ain't from Chicago, you don't know about the type of living. We talk about Maxwell Street. And this may sound racist. There was an area called Jewtown where we used to get our Maxwell polishes mm -hmm. and our pork chop sandwiches and our cheeseburgers. Old school Jewtown, which is now UIC campus. UIC campus on there by Taylor Street. So. And just to let you know how I go back in my age here, because actually, uh, I'll be 41 next week, or hey. So to talk about the 80s here, when you used to be hanging out in Jewtown, you could uh stock up if you had your own little hustle, like you sold t shirts, you can buy uh like 14 pack of tube socks and two portals for like five bucks. You remember when we were at aerosol and we basically got that place smelling up like oh you i did do that didn't i yes he did we sent this man on a road trip <laughs> uh nice what 20 mile road trip to go get us some uh some pork, pork chop sandwiches grilled, like, I mean, it's a cheeseburger some polishes uh, and, and cheeseburgers and a whole bunch of grapes we had pie. the car smelling that way brought it up to the office area that whole that whole section of the floor smelled like maxwell's uh, it was hood it was hood heaven <laughs> then you go back to the car on the way home and i know it smelled the same way, uh, the way back. Like, uh, no that smell don't come out of your car for like three or four days minimum oh and then the fifth day you still had that little hint depending on what you've done to the car or how you cleaned it oh yeah if you missed uh, an onion or something that's that's like just like an air freshener in the car and let me add too like for the younger days when we used to kick in the clubs and you coming out and it'd be like two three in the morning and if you didn't go to the sit down spot like on hollywood boulevard or like that hey, man that hits at 3 a.m man 3 a.m drunk from the club and you're like about to fall asleep watching whatever's on tv and then you wake up the next morning and you're like you see the bites on your table like oh man what a hell of a night yeah yeah i mean and basically you're equivalent <laughs> if you couldn't get some of that maxwell street white castle oh yes yes oh man whatever gets you through that night but at the end of the day though you be going to the porcelain gods though <laughs> yes one way or another one way or another if it's coming kind of, depend on how you handle depend on your stomach is it come out one way or it coming out the other way you know or if you just got a cast iron stomach you can handle that depending on how you've been drinking but well, that's our flashback moment yes definitely oh and for those people who get it all at the same time if you got one out and oh the other way, uh, yeah. okay. okay next next subject sir all right let's keep it moving here with some boxing here look we're lighting it up here we're we're, we're going into once again the hotbed division we're talking about Javante Davis. Yeah. Uh, he fights at 135 in the one the hotbed division, but he not only fights at 135, he fights at 130. He campaigned at 126. And he might be going to 140, Jorge. So 140. So uh, if anybody caught our last show, we I kind of threw out some ideas there for Devin Haney. And one of the thoughts that I had there, like one of the options was for the man to carve out his own path at 140. So it's interesting that from the last episode back on tuesday to the what this was wednesday when we were talking about this when you said when uh you caught me up with this article here so 140 dave is going to 140 and it looks like it's gonna be for one fight right and we'll get into the details as to what you know the uh the model that floyd's going with managing his uh his promote you know his uh his boxing career right now mm -hmm. but you know what i thought for Devin haney you know in the typical promotional boxer model now is that you if you're going to go to Carve out your own path, campaign at 140, get yourself some belts so that way you have some leverage uh, down the road in, when the other fighters from the 135 division come up to 140, a.k.a. Lopez or Ryan Garcia or Davis in this case, right? But now with Davis making this move to 140 for a fight, and we don't know what's going to happen you know, hope, you know, with the results of that fight, right? If he does come out ahead and win that fight, does he stay at 140, right? It's uh, one thing to be a young man and have the flexibility to go from 140 down to the lowest 126 and fight. Uh, it's another thing whether that's a smart move 
um, depending on one from one fight to the next fight, right? So I, I can understand going from 140 to 135 between from one fight to the next fight. Uh, God forbid he has to go from 140 to 126 for another fight because I just think that's no, nah, that's that's not that's Roy Jones territory. No, Roy gonna... Jones territory from a lightweight point of view. Yeah, so it's not signed yet, but that it looked like it's pretty close here. So he was on the undercard here as far as Mario Barrios, 140 pound. Um, he actually has the WBA regular title okay. you know there's the regular title super champion there's so many titles in the wba but he's an undefeated fighter he's uh 20 uh 26 no 17 knockouts and he came off a six-round ko on the undercard of the tank davis fight when he fought leo santa cruz mm. so it's not like tank is fighting a nobody he's not fighting the scrub he's not gonna fight like some dude is ranked 18th and 135 or something like that or he's fighting an undefeated bigger man than him tank is five five and a half mm. this guy's five ten so he's given up five, four and a half, five inches in height. He's given up. He's going into a higher weight class. And so here's a guy at 135 last fight. He fought at 130 before that. He bounces around. So this is a good test for him. Like, I mean, I'm, we were talking about how Floyd carving out his career and certain fights may not be available. We were talking about Devin Haney, you know, um, looking for fights and not able to fight anybody. We talk about Ryan Garcia, you know, how he fought Luke Campbell, but who is he going to fight now, you know? And so this is Tank taking on a suitable challenger to kind of cement his way as one of the best fighters in the world right now. Uh, I think if he wins this fight, depending how he wins this fight, because I will say this, it is for a man 5'10", who's probably going to come into that weighing maybe over the 140 limit by that point, maybe 140. 150, easily. 150 10, easily. 7 to 10 pounds. Here's, here's where, I, correct me if I'm wrong here. Seven. If a guy's in great shape, I say 7 to 10 pounds easily, guys, on the minimum, right? Mm -hmm. Outside of guys like Floyd Mayweather who walk around their weight because he's a freaking billionaire and he was able to pay anybody he want to, you know, as far as his chefs, things that nature to, to, to fight his weight. Oh, he'd be paid you know. for the best nutritionist to yeah. help him out with all this stuff. But most guys, now, even their best weight, they're in their class, they're going up at least like 7 to 10 pounds overnight. See, exactly. So so I think for this fight, I mean, and... So I'm saying 145, 150 for Barrios. I don't think... Easily, minimum. I, I'm, I'm, I'm to the... I'm already in mind saying to myself, I don't think Davis knocks him out. So I'm actually kind of curious to see. And I, I'm not saying Davis can't knock him out. I just don't see it for the reasons you specified, 5'10", and what we're talking about with his weight. So I think from a power point of view, if he knocks him out, that would be I, I, it's actually kind of earth-shattering from my perspective because I'd be like, I wouldn't, you wouldn't see it coming. Right, you wouldn't expect it. Not that, not that Davis can't knock on anybody. I just wouldn't be surprised to knock out somebody that big. It all depends on how Barrios comes to the fight as far as boxing technique and style is concerned. Hey. Because Leo Santa Cruz was winning the fight. Boxing tank. You know, up until <laughs> the, the hook, and then he looked at him and put him to sleep. He's like, you make sure you down. You know, yeah. go down. You know, but he do that hook. But that the key to fighting tank, obviously, because he's such a he's built like a freaking tank. The key is, can you not allow him to land a shot? Because on because once he lands a clean shot, cancel Christmas. You know what I'm saying? Because Leo was winning that fight. Now, Tank was landing some good shots, but they weren't knockout shots, and Leo has a chin. He's not a glass jaw guy. Yeah. You know, he, he takes a licking and keeps coming back and throws 100 punches around. You know, it's just the fact that can you keep Tank on the outside for 12 rounds? Because once he gets inside and he clips you, cancel it. Because the one time he didn't get a knockout was like freaking six, seven years ago now. They had to have seen something on the, on film where they think he, and this is Barrios, right? That's his mm -hmm. list, doesn't have a good inside game. That, that's the only thing I can think of. Because or I, they think that Tank can over, he may have an inside, but he can be overwhelmed by Tank. I, 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 but that, that, and that's Same thing, of, just worded a little bit differently I, I, from no, my no, standpoint. Exactly, guys. right. Exactly, right. If, he, if you're seeing an overwhelming advantage or an edge you think you can do inside, that that's the only thing I can think of, right? So I would have to watch so the tape on this guy. I mean, to me, he's under, for an undefeated guy. Who has uh, a belt. So he's uh, not fine. He's not fine. No chump guy. He's he, he knew his regular title is undefeated. Bigger weight class, so it's it's a legit test. It does, it's definitely a legit test. Not uh, even a test; it's a fight. He's a champion. Yep. I mean, no, he's a title. Like I gotta make sure I get my title right. holder, title holder, or title list. He's not a champion. The champion is the man. Like Canelo is the champion. You know, Barrios is a title holder, a title list. Yeah, exactly. So I I think uh, no matter what anybody says, Davis is going to be in for a tough test, and uh, I like it though. I like I, I, I like the test. I like the challenge. I 
I can't actually say for certain because until I've seen some tape on Barrios, mm-hmm. I can't say for sure Davis is going to win that fight. But that, that fight I'm looking forward to watching because it's a challenge and he's definitely stepping up to the plate and he's uh, making the move that I suggested Haney should have made previous episode. So he basically, it's funny how we talked about it mm-hmm. and like a day later, the person that I thought should be making it, somebody else ended up doing it instead. And it's it's interesting because like I said, well, it's bring the, bring the question up that you had before we started this up here. Do you remember we were talking? Yeah. Oh yeah. We have. We have, so we have Since you're jer- saying that now, so basically it's the the move to one forty. We and, and this was like kind of like our, our part of our pre meeting, but I thought this was a great topic to bring up for a discussion here. Is the model that Floyd's employing with Davis the way you've described it? I'll let you describe it because I like, I like your thoughts on it. And especially when you put it together, it's the. We're not looking to collect belts type of model. We're looking to make a star out of you without the belts, Mm -hmm. which is from a casual fan's point of view. And even from, I mean, from a, from a boxing nut to a casual fan, I can kind of see that dichotomy and see that, how that might, or someone might look at things differently there. The titles themselves are in most cases, the attraction, right? Because if I'm going to watch a fighter, unless I'm watching a prospect, most casual fans won't know about that prospect unless He's like Ryan Garcia, where he's marketed himself so much on social media that they he actually has fans that are doing that. But mm-hmm. even but outside of Ryan Garcia, which I think is the anomaly in this case, most of the time you need to already have a belt on you to be known by any casual fan. Health promotion, right? So people it, people see belts and WBC see that yeah, and they see hey, exactly. You got to be you, something you, to get you, that. You see straps, they think you had to have beaten people to get to that point. Mm-hmm. So your thoughts on Floyd's model with Tank da- with Tank Davis and how do you think that goes moving forward, right? Or is is, is even doing a great? Is it even a good idea, right? Compared to what others do in the sport that are still uh, old fashioned, but they still work because it's survived the test of time and they do it that way with the belts. I see this. You know, we talk about it before we hit the record button and I have some time to think about it now. I said that tank is a fighter about a home. Sure. And the reason why I say that though, is because the model of fighting normally that you, you're once a young fighter, you know, trainers, they, they bounce back and forth. They do catch weights till they find out what is the optimum weight class for them. You might see a guy who ends up at 130. He may start up at 135. And then they say, hey, okay, let's see if we can get the nutrition down so you can stay consistently at 130 or 126, you know, because you're a young kid and your metabolism. But for Tank, I say this is different because he has Floyd in his corner. And when you have Floyd helping you promote and still relevant in the game today, it's not like he retired like 20 years ago. He retired a few years ago. Mm-hmm. Floyd is saying that we don't need belts. We'll get belts when they come by. I want to make you a star, make you bigger than belts. Because at the end of Floyd's career, he didn't care about belts. When he beat Manny Pacquiao, he didn't even pay the sanction fee for WBO belt. Yeah. So I didn't want it. Now it's funny. He paid the sanction belt for the WBA and WBC. He had relationships with them. But he didn't care. Like he even mentioned recently with the Roy Jones fight and the Tyson exhibition, how Roy's like, yo, we I, give me a belt. I'll take a belt in time. I mentioned this on the previous show. And Floyd, Floyd was one that came out and said, No, we need less belts. We got too many titles out here. We got too many people who think they're champions. It's only gonna be one champion. Canel's at the same thing too. No, I, I agree with that sentiment as yeah. well. There's too many. I, I I don't disagree with too many belts. I do agree you need at least one belt. Yeah, you need at least one belt. You need a champion, but he's saying there's too many belts, right? I agree so with that sentiment. So Floyd is looking at the fact that at 135, Tia Fima got all the belts, right? Mm-hmm. You know, so you're not crossing the ship to ESPN right now because if you look at Floyd's business model, if you got someone across the street, he ain't going to do that fight right now. No. It's, it's best to let it marinate and hold because you do the fight now at 135, you do it on pay-per-view. I say right now today, it might do if you're lucky. Uh, five six hundred thousand because tank on his own could do 300 now if you've seen that and he could fill up baltimore you add tia female the espn push six seven hundred thousand floyd's thinking bigger than that like i made the example with, we're talking about manny pacquiao and floyd they're both at fault reason why it took freaking five years for that fight to happen yeah, I mean, people i've had arguments in barbershop people said floyd's at fault no both are at fault they both knew what they were doing floyd recognized it first then manny and aram got on board with it later you know because the initial fight was supposed to make fifty million a piece, that fifty million turned to a hundred million guarantee for Floyd and eighty for Manny. That turned to two fifty and like a hundred and fifty for Manny, and the money's still trickling from the pay per view now. <laughs> whatever it is, mm. Floyd made close to three four hundred million before taxes on that fight compared to fifty million. Yeah. So Floyd's model is like, look, look what I did, Tank. 
We don't got to do these fights here. He got all the belts. You think we're going to cross the street here to ESPN? No, nah, I ain't ready yet. Ryan Garcia? No, nah, I ain't ready yet. Here's what we're going to do here. I'm going to make you a star. We're going to make this money. We're going to sell off these stadiums. You're going to be tied to me. My influence next to you, when you knocking everybody out and our infrastructure at Showtime now, we're going to make you a star. And if eventually a belt comes by, hey, so be it. Like right now, this Barlow's fight is for our, you know regular title. It ain't the top belt because we have the unification at 140 in May. <laughs> so so, so Barlow's is the mandatory to one of those guys right that. now. So it's one of those things like all these belts are tied up right now. At 140, you have the unification in May. 35, TP Muga got all the belts. And then you look at 130, and it's like, okay, you know, it's kind of open, but it's, you know, so he's like, hey, we're just going to fight the guys. You're going to make this money. I'm going to make you a star because when you start, I make more money. Mm -hmm. That's why I look at a Floyd right now. But everybody can't do that. And I want you to get your, get your opinion on this. I don't think Devin Haney can do that because he don't have Floyd in his side. I didn't disagree with you. I just didn't think it could happen with Devin Haney when he brought up last week because he has Eddie Hearn, and Eddie Hearn is a fighter's guy. He's overpaid his fighters, and that's why guys like him. You're going to overpay me to fight these bums? Sure. I'm worth $1 million. You can pay me $3 million? Hey, all bets are off. Eddie Hearn don't have the cachet as Floyd does right now by still by being still a current fighter, technically. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what you think about that, but I look at the fact that Floyd, being who he is, he is just using what he created into his next form of life now, being a promoter, and he has a star now, and says, hey, forget the belts. We just going to get this paper. Uh. I and the belts come along, come along. But eventually, you know, he's going to have to fight Tiafima Lopez if him and Aaron can do a deal or Devin Haney down the line. But it's like, hey, if this is not happening right now, we're going to do our own path. Yeah. I would say if it wasn't for COVID, I would agree with everything that Floyd would be thinking about. If, if that's the plan, if that's his model verbatim, like how you describe it and stuff, then I, I get why you would think that. I think COVID kind of changes the landscape and probably negotiating. And I mean, if he's thinking that fight is probably maybe a couple more years away and he would want to marinate a little bit more. It is. I think he'd probably have to trim it by at least a year. And the only reason I'm, I'm thinking that is because by now, I mean, Lopez didn't fight. I mean, he fought Lomachenko and he hasn't fought since. This Haney didn't fight for a while. He's got a fight coming up with, uh, you know, we'll talk to them about the main schedule, but he's got a fight mm -hmm. that's, uh, it looks like it's already a signed deal for some fight sometime in May on the zone. So we'll cover that in a moment. But, and, and then Davis didn't fight anybody for a while. Then he got the injury as well. So that kind of derailed whatever he might have had going on with Garcia. And then Garcia is no different as well. So they're all talking the talk on, on social media, but then they're not looking forward to getting in the ring with each other. And I think because of COVID, they're going to kind of need each other much sooner than I think most promoters would want them to marinate a fight. Um, so I don't, you know, it's funny when we talk, because when we talked in a pre meeting, I kind of compared like what the mode of thinking for Floyd with this model he's trying to employ with Davis as something similar to what Billy Bean did with Moneyball. Not so much, we're not talking about analytics and stuff, but we're talking in terms of the philosophical new way of doing things and being the first to kick it through the door. And, you know, being able to, you know, and not everybody's going to agree with it. You're going to be the first one to get all the criticisms and everything for managing a fighter a certain way. Like, if it doesn't work out, it's going to come back on Floyd. Uh, it's, it's, I mean, Davis is the boxer in this case, but. I don't think it's going to come back on Floyd. You know why? There's there's enough behind the scenes with, not, not to demonize them, there's enough behind the scenes with Tank that whatever's going to happen is going to be on Tank. He has a. I'm, I don't need to repeat them. He has a lot of personal problems. I'm not trying to say that's oh, the yeah, issue. Yeah, yeah. But, 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 I'm, but, yeah. but what you're saying, though, I just th I just look at they've done a good job trying to protect Tank, trying to get make sure he get his life straight. But there's a lot of stuff behind the scenes that the point they're trying to make is never going to bolt back on a promoter. You know what I'm saying? Unless they put him in a fight that everybody knows he should not be and he's going to lose. Like, yo, you fighting at 147, the guy who's six foot one. You know, like like Errol Spence, for instance, you know, you're not going to put him in against Errol Spence. You know what I'm saying? Like, fight something like this, like, yo, what the heck is Floyd thinking? Like that, you know what I mean? But anything like that and knowing Javante's background, the promoters don't get that back like, unless they wait too long to put a fight on for somebody. And, 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 or, you know, like, if they said Lopez, like, we wait like five years. Then that's on the promoter set, well, you know? Well, well, in this case, I wouldn't – and this is the thing, right, with Floyd, right? So we can't talk about the model he's trying to employ with Davis – 
and not absolve him of fault if it doesn't work out the way it's supposed to. Like, like the, the, the boxer is in control of his life, and he's you're right. He's in a position where he could do it all by himself and make it all go south all by his own, right? But in saying this example, he does everything he needs to do with his life, take care of everything he needs to do correctly, not get into any kind of trouble that would derail him from getting into a fight or getting suspended or getting his license revoked or something like that, right? So at this point, we're basically saying, Floyd's model for employing the deploying the fighter and trying to make the fighter into the star he's trying to make without the belt. If that doesn't work out, then it does happen to fall on Floyd. No, no, why? Because Tank's rich. I'm not again. We can't we can't praise the model when it is working and then not praise it when it isn't working. But here's the thing, though. Right now it's you, working. Right now it's working but for now. You're not going to blame a promoter anytime because the guys just go up one or two weight classes. You're going to, you're going to, unless he's, it's a mismatch. When it's a clear mismatch and it's bad brokering with the, with, who are you trying to put him against? Name a situation where you blame the promoter. This scenario could go bad. This scenario where the Davis is fighting Burials, that could go bad. Why would no? I no, no, I'm not. It's not gonna go bad. No, why? Because Steven Espinosa in the Showtime is in the bank with Tank Davis, right? Everybody's in here. He is the he is their future star on Showtime. Like the way is way Al Heyman has it worked out. He has fighters on Showtime. He has fighters on Fox. So this is the Steven Espinosa guy here on Showtime and the pay per view model. So you're going to put him in guys who you know he could beat or give him credible tests. Now you say you, you keep saying it's going to blow up. If it's going to blow up, I'm it, not saying it's going to blow up. No, no, he said, I'm saying but I'm saying, though, if it blows up, then it's a fight that was badly mismatched. That's right. what, and, and think about it. You, you, Floyd is not going to do a mismatch fight unless it's Ford Tank. When has Floyd done something that was not in his favor? After he I, broke I, away from Bob I, Aaron. I, I, get what, I get what you're saying. Yeah. But all it takes is one fight. This is why but, we love, was why we was why we watched the sport in the first place. But it, it takes one fight. If the guy loses, we never blame the promoter. We because after the fight, think about it. When a guy loses after the fight, we find all the stuff that dribbles afterwards. Like he needed surgery. You know, it's like like for instance, like the Floyd fight. Let's do Floyd for example. When the controversy fight with uh, Cast um with Castillo or Corrales, I can't remember the two C's. But he had the rematch and came back seven months later. Castillo, yeah. yeah, but. Aaron, Aaron did get blamed for it, like when it was controversy. Even though he won, it's like, oh, and they had, like, Floyd. No one blamed Aaron in that fight. And they found out like, he had he had a bad shoulder cup, and he had the surgery and killed him out. You, if you have bad matchmaking, that's when the promoter gets involved. Like, you see a fight, it's like, man, this guy's a boxer who likes an outside, and this guy's another boxer, but he's a southpaw. He never be southpaws. Why would you put him in a southpaw unless you give him a touch-up fight? You know what I'm saying? Like, sure. so unless it's bad matchmaking. You're never blaming the promoter. Like we see it a, a million miles ahead. We see Tank is five, five and a half, and he fights a guy that's five eleven with a seventy three inch range, and who pumps a jab like Antonio Margarito with a hundred punches around. Now Leo Santa Cruz type, but doesn't have any power, so they knew he could walk through him and, and clip him. But if you have a guy that throws hundred punches and has power, and Tank can't get on the inside, we all see that. We see that type of fighter and be like, "Yo, why would you match with that when we also that coming a mile away?" Bad matchmaking will cause that. If it's just, he just get clipped. You know, we're not going to say, oh, why did Floyd do that? If it was a good match fight, like you see the styles and all of a sudden the guy loses, we never blame the promoter. I, I think promoters, every once in a while, promoters are going to have a bad day, right? And a, a, a good example is actually was not that long ago. Miguel Cotto versus Austin Trout. That wasn't a Miguel Cotto pick. But we that. knew that was a bad fight. I told you, you remember, I said, I don't know why he did that fight. I, I, I Even before it even happened, like Trout, Southpaw, taller, longer. I saw that exactly. Bad matchmaking, and I called. I saw that a mile uh, away. That that the, the reason and the reason why the match happens because Cotto at that point has already fought southpaws. He's fought southpaws. He fought regular guys. Cotto himself is a softball by trait. He just he just switches to the orthodox because basically he uses his power hand as his lead jab, but he basically is a southpaw fighter. The result of that fight was a loss, but that is due to the combination of. One, one accepting the fight, and the other one's bad matchmaking. I'm but saying, but I, I, you I, you made my argument though. You literally brought up a, a fight that even I he, we can pull people in who knew me back then. I said, why is he fighting Austin Trout? Because that was it didn't make no sense money monetary wise. The money was it, it, the money wasn't even good enough for him to take that fight. I thought like he made top dollar, but the risk reward wasn't there. He was he was a guy who said, I'm I'm a champ. Cool. I'm I'm bad. I'm a badass. I fight anybody, but. There should have been someone in this corner and be like, nah, you don't need to. In, 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 let's say in, in 2004, yeah, we can do this fight, Kodo. And what was that fight in 2013, 2014? No, we don't need this fight, Kodo. 
Kodo did so, that. So and so, and matter of fact, that was not even the matchmaker. Kodo was had bounced around. He had left Amber at that point, so he was like technically a free agent. So that's Kodo. This remember his vividly now because he that's how he got the fight with uh, Floyd because he had left Aram. So that's actually Kodo working and being his own boss. That's not even Aram. No, I believe that was a one time contract signing with Aram before he took the fight on his own after that. No, no, the, wait, no. Austin Trials was Showtime. Once he once he did the fight with Showtime, he was way from Aram. He came back to Aram when he did the Margarito fight, the, um, the second Margarito fight when he got the rematch. Mm. But he was away from Aram. That's how he hit the Floyd fight. That fight does not happen as he's with Aram. He he ended up doing. He, he ended up, there's no way he did. He, can, he comes back. He came back. Though I'm saying he came back to Aram. He bounced. You know, like he did his thing. But the, to do the Showtime deal, he is not with Aram. Uh, and so and so that was that was Kodo technically trying to be his own boss. No, he is, I don't I don't think that was the case there. But in any case. Because because Aram because Aram hates Showtime with a passion. Aram did one here's here's some history for you too. Aram did one fight with Showtime with Manny Pacquiao around 2011 with Shane Mosley. This was during the time, of course, they were going back and forth, and Shane, I mean uh, Manny and Floyd were fighting similar guys or you know whatever they have fallen that pattern until they fought each other. And once he he had done uh, business with Showtime years ago before that fight, and then once he did that fight with Shane Mosley and Manny Pacquiao, he said, I'll never go back to Showtime ever again. There was so much animosity with Bob Aaron Showtime, even leading to that fight. He didn't even want to go to Showtime. They did a one-off because HBO wouldn't even pay for the fight, you know? So he did Showtime the one-off, and then that was it. So by the time that Aram, and by the time you had Floyd and Cotto together, there was no Aram involved. That was strictly a Golden Boy Promotions production. And then Golden Boy was running, went to Showtime. Then the same as Canelo, they all left HBO, went to Showtime. Now, he was under the Golden Boy banner, but like a free agent like Floyd. He was he had that little model for a few fights, and then he went back to Aaron when he got the Margarito fight. So this is basically the fight coming off the Mayweather loss. Mm -hmm. so, and and, yeah, and, yeah, and yeah. then that and like I said, that that's during a time when he left Aram and he was he was a de facto free agent like Floyd yeah, doing he was, Golden he was a free Boy. Agent, but he definitely yeah, but he, he definitely signed. Yeah, so but, words, but, but but here's so. the thing though, Cotto was like Floyd, he was his own boss. Oscar and Richard Sherrod did not tell him to take that fight. That's on Cotto. I don't know, we don't know that for sure. We do know I, that you think because here's what happened: they paid him and he took the fight because Cotto doesn't take it. I'm telling you because you had to look that up. Aram is not involved no, in that. That's that's, that's all just, Golden just, Boy. Just, that's just more of the timeline. Just want to understand this was before me, whether after it made sense it was after me, whether because yeah, because the Showtime the fight was on Showtime. If you look at how you know fighters and promoters is by networks. If it's Showtime, it ain't Aram. I that's like, no, I, I, understand, <laughs> no, I understand that at the time and stuff, but as well, so basically you took the fight because. Golden Boy told me should. No, no, I no, uh, I know. Though I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop right here. This is this is the debate argument that I'm waiting here for with you. At this point in Cotto's career, in 2012 and 2013, Oscar and Richard Sheffield ain't telling Cotto nothing. The same way they weren't telling Floyd mm. nothing. That is not happening. What's gonna What's gonna happen is now you're part of the roster here. We got these fights here, and the, and then Cotto looking at his teams like, yeah, we can do this one here, and whatever the case may be. There is no situation that Oscar made Cotto on the second fight of that on, on work with Golden Boy. It's one thing if he was a young fighter like in the beginning, like in 2004 of mm. Aram. Oscar could not do that to Cotto, and he could not do that to. Floyd or guys like that coming on on those contracts like that. That Richard Schaefer would not even do that. That's Cotto being a man of pride, think he could be being the man he is, and took a fight that he lost. And that's that's a bad business move. And we've seen too, Cotto's had a couple of bad business moves and in, in, in boxing fights. He took fights he shouldn't have taken, mm -hmm. you know. But then after that, he went back to Aram and he got the Margaret fight and got his justice. So I'm just saying that there's no way. Oscar and Richard Schaefer is making Cotto take a fight after they went all out to get him from Aram, the first to do the Floyd fight, and then to keep him over at Showtime. That does not happen for a made man like Cotto. Maybe six years earlier in 2007 when you're younger in your career, 2006, but not at 2013, 2014, Cotto. No, Sorry. no, well, because Cotto, no, no. Because see this thing, because you're putting Cotto into the same mindset that he was with Floyd Mayweather. No, not. no, I'm not saying the mindset. No, no, I'm just no, saying no, that no, he no. fought so hard, Jorge. He fought so hard to get off away from Aram. He is not going to yeah. put him back in the same spot. And matter of fact, too, it was uh, we can look this up and put on the next episode. It was on a contract to contract, a fight to fight basis. He was being locked up long term like Floyd. He was on a per fight no. basis. 
No, he landed. He's, he's he had to sign like a fighter one, two, one or two fight contract. No, with, no, with, because with, the way Richard Schaefer was working, the same way, because the, what was going on behind the scenes with Oscar De La Hoya and taking the fighters away from him. Remember when he was like, had the rehab and the the Canelo fight, and he was away, and all the contracts for HBO mm. were. Jorge, listen, you can look this up. I'll put a hundred dollars on this one here. During a time period when Oscar had no, his that, name, well, that's that's a no, 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 but, here, but, but no, no, but here, but, he but here's the thing though, when Oscar had his drug problems. And then with the Showtime, Richard Schaefer and Al him behind the scenes eliminated every single contract from every single fighter. Every fighter turned to on a fight per fight basis. And that allowed Al Heyman to swoop in and take the whole company and the fighters away from Oscar De La Hoya. The reason why they had the big lawsuit and the reason why Al Heyman had to cut a check to, um, to Oscar. But in the end, though, Golden Boy Promotions turned into premier boxing champions. That was the same model when Cotto had left Aram. It was on a fight per fight basis. Every fighter eventually, by the end of that deal, had no contract with HBO or Showtime. And when they went full sledge, and Oscar was just in the cold. Actually, I'm reading it right now for Trout. He was, when he fought Delvin Rodriguez and when he fought Trout, he was still under the top rank banner. What's that? He was under the top rank banner still. That does not make sense because, yeah. because Eric, because I remember for a fact, Cotto saying he was a free agent unless, hold on though, you, you, you got me there. There was a point where that Cotto was paying a part of his contract to top rank, yeah, but yeah. he was no longer there employed. Was, was, the was, same was... thing, the same thing that happened when Manny Pacquiao, the under the deal table, when, when uh, Oscar came with the briefcase and that the judges decide that Manny was liable for deceiving practices. And so Oscar was getting a cut of Manny Pacquiao's contract. With, uh, with, with top rank during that time period for the end of that th period, though. But Aaron was gone. Uh, Aaron was out of the picture, and he came back. For Trout and Rodri for Delvin Rodriguez and then the Austin Trout fight, he was still on the top rank. I'll come back to that. I'll come back to that because I remember vividly. But here's the thing, though. If you're, if, let's, say, let's say, for instance, I'm wrong, right? Then you're going to tell me that Aaron made him fight a De La Hoya guy in Austin Trout? Um, look, nah. At the, at the end of the day, look. Nah. He had, look, at the end of the day, no one... He, I, knowing Coda, I know how Coda was. Most of these Puerto Rican fighters, they honor their contract, and, they, and that's the way they look at it. That's just the way they were born and raised for the most part. If I sign something, if I've signed a fight fight deal, I'm fighting fight fights. Basically, as a promoter, help me get those what those fights are, who's on my schedule, and, and then Coda would say it all the time. It's up to my promoter. Trinidad would say it to Don King. It's all up to my promoter. They all say, say that, that, man, they, they, because they, they, there's a script, like they say of Al Heyman. Uh, I was saying I shout out to my uh, my advisor, Al Heyman. They it they because it because when it comes to there's a PR guy that says you're not gonna say this in the public, you're gonna say things in private. That's what happens yeah, for the most part. But for the most the thing is that by that point in their career, Coder doesn't have to keep doing that, but he still does it. And my, my point is, is that, and that's the reason why I was really like, you know, double checking this stuff. Not because I wanted to prove you wrong or whatever, because we've had these conversations before. I just wanted to make sure we get the facts right on this one for the for the audience and stuff. Cotto basically is never going to call out a guy. Maybe you'll hear it. Maybe little whistles up, but he'll no, never. He, no, he's, he's never not, done he's, that. He's, yeah, he's, I he's, know not, that. He's, not, he's not verbal that way. But mainly because of his own language barrier and the way. I mean, basically, if you watch Cotto through his career, his English is a lot better than Felix Trinidad's. But Trinidad it's, never but, learned the English exactly. Thing. But he basically made the effort to do it, right? So. No matter what, he was always going to rely on his promoter to do all the talking and everything setting for the fight. So I know Cody. But but and you're like, but you're making the point that you would think that either Aaron or De La Hoya, like I said, when you're on Showtime, whether he had a part of that contract, whatever the case may be, in 2012 or 2013, I'm saying they're Cole, not making him fight an Austin Trout guy. There was it's not even it's not even a money fight. I, it's not even at this point. It's like well, at this point they already fought Floyd, so their money fight was already kind of like done. They're basically they're mostly moving on to the next chapter of his career. This was like his last fight at 147 against Mayweather. Goes no, no, he was no, he was at 154. He was the champion. He was the junior middleweight champion. Was that? Yes, that was at 154. Yeah, Floyd only had three fights at 154: Conor McGregor, uh, Cotto, and Canelo. That's that junior oh, middleweight. Yeah, right, right, right. 151 and 154. That's yeah. what I'm saying, yeah, though. Yeah, and, okay, and, and it wasn't even a catchweight because Floyd knew that because yeah, because right. was a small junior middleweight you're anyway. Right, you're right. And so I'm saying at that point in his career, he's already a, a three-division champion. Yeah, you're right. You're right. You're, right. you're not you're not going to court and say you're fighting Austin Trout. Is the point I'm saying, no, though. But, it's like, do you want to fight Austin Trout? And here's the price tag. And then Cotto Price said, oh, for that price tag, I'll fight Cotto, Austin Trout. Cotto, look, I think at the end of the day, Cotto was going to start campaigning at 154. I mean, his old goal was always to get to 160. That was his goal no matter what. So basically, after Mayweather, 
It wasn't like he was searching for a rematch. He was, it, of course, he'd take it if it was off. Oh, it, it was, it was, it was talked about, but no one wanted to pay as uh, much money, especially how much money it made. It will, it, it would have crashed the second time around unless you had enough time to build it back up, which uh, you knew exactly. was going to happen. Exactly. Yeah. So basically, he needed to start campaigning on one before making reparations for one sixty. Yeah, that's what made sense for him to fight Delvin Rodriguez first, and then Austin Trout, and that's what it was: Rodriguez first, then Trout. So, well, actually, Mayweather, Rodriguez, then Trout at one fifty four. Mm. So. In a way, it kind of made sense if you're going to go to 160. Because he, he, he wasn't going to go to 160 for the perfect fight. Now, I know we got to end this here. 160 was the perfect scenario because Martinez was the champion sure. and he was at 154 previously and went to 160 and he got a shot and he was campaigning for a long time and couldn't get the money fight that he was looking for. So it was just a perfect storm. He said he wanted to go to 160 for the perfect fight. He wasn't going to fight. You know the other guys. Reason why you know we got to cut this short. We should do a talk on Cotto. That's your boy. He 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 was not fighting Triple G, my, my, he, my, but he was fighting Sergio Martinez. My my, my whole point with that. But the, Martinez wasn't fighting Triple G. You see how that worked out for everybody? Not for Triple G, of course. So this is simply, <laughs> so, folks. If you're not paying attention, this is basically our conversation, right? So we had a debate about the main point and debated about other things along the way. Now I'm going to take it back to the main point. Long story short, my thesis. The end of my thesis. Some promoters will have a bad day. That's it. Bad matchmaking, I say it's a bad day. It's a bad day. Bad matchmaking, bad day. That's and the way I look my, at it. My thing is it's bad matchmaking, but take away bad matchmaking, it's always on the fighter. Because we're because uh, we're gonna hear, oh, he had a broken rose hitter cup, or he broke his hand in the second round, or he had a hard time making weight. He's going up to the next week. Like Bert Chet, like we're seeing all these things he should have won, and all we're seeing now, like he, you're hearing the miscellaneous issues that he had. Now I was reading an article, oh, no, and, well, and then now, was the same way. Yeah, too. and the same thing Lomachenko now is like, oh, he starts like every time like something like that happens because you know the fighters will come with the excuse. I'll say the fighters for the most part will come the excuses. Wilder, that's a great example of a man full of excuses and still coming up with them to this day. Let me let me let me, let me prefer this better here so that you might agree with this better here the promotion company is the entity is the brand behind the whole thing right sure they're the fortune 500 company per se right they have the pr they have everything lined up here business everything right mm. the most fighters don't have that so everything's in place so that no matter what even if the promoter was that there's so many smoke and mirrors that the fighters gonna get blamed for it anyway unless it's bad matchmaking and my point is, is that, that so, uh, so take away bad matchmaking. I'm saying it's always going to be in a fight because the business of the promoter is a business. They have employees. They have people who punch a clock. So they've done everything in their power for the fighter. So then if the fighter doesn't cover their goose and eggs. The reason why I'm saying that is that that's how the fighter gets blamed nine times out of ten. I, I, that's I, that's that's my point. I'm saying I, I, should, I should make that better. I, I, well, and I think the way you here, I should make my point when, better. When 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 when. when you can't give the praise to Floyd. I'm not giving praise. No, 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 no. But if Floyd's the man, right? Floyd's the man of his promotional company, right? He's the CEO, last I checked. And at the end of the day, he's trying a different model with Davis, right? If that model works for Davis, Davis is going to come out looking great because for his career. And to some respect, Floyd's going to have a big part of that and going to get a lot of praise for that. If it doesn't work out and it has nothing to do with the fighter because of his own, you know, him doing something messed up completely that would revoke his license or get him suspended or just do him harm at the public. If it's nothing to do with the fighter, then if something goes wrong with that model, it has to fall back on the CEO. And last I checked, that's Floyd. That's the only, that's my only point. Will it, will it fail? I'm not saying it would fail. I'm not saying, I'm not even hoping that it would fail. I'm just saying he's employing a different model apart that what Aram's done for what Hearn's done, what most of boxing promoting history has done where they've at least tried to build up their fighters to get a belt. And Floyd's employing a different model where he's trying not to require that whatsoever. He's not making it. He's not making it a priority to get the let, belt. He's making it a second, even a third type of thing. No, I'm. Let me agree with you and add on to that as we close out. Sure. The these guys don't cross the street. It's a problem. There's more money staying in house than going across the street. It's the problem. Everybody who has sure. all the major belts are across the street per se. ESPN and you know TFMO 135, 140, same thing. ESPN got all those belts here. You're at Showtime. Yeah. So if you do a fight, you have to split the profits. Like you still got to pay your fighter. They got to pay their fighter, but the profit margin gets split from the gates, everything else, the pay-per-view, whatever's going down the model. Right. Mm -hmm. So when you put all these things in place like that, Floyd's saying like, yo, we got to cross everybody. Even Bob Aram says it. We got cross street. We got to cut the cost. Like it's, 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 it's more, it's more, it's less risk when you do that, but you don't get the reward of all the money. So when you look at it, it's like, Hey, you, you there's no money there for you. The money's there, but it's not there for you. So what do you want to do? Do you want TFMO for, uh, let's say, $2 million, Or do you want to wait 
two or three years and I get you 10. I, 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 I and guess. so that, that, that it's, it's, it's unique, the situation here, right? Sure. Because you add Floyd and then you add the fact that all these titles are gone and people don't like the cross street. It's a very unique circumstance that could change in May. We didn't get a chance to talk about it right this second, but sure. it can change in May. Like, I, I, I just touch on this really fast. You have a unification at 140. Then normally when you have a unification like that, one belt's got to go. Because yeah. you know the politics, you know, mandatory. You, you, once on the speed is, once Unless once the time. guy says, I'm going to fight that guy right away to keep all the belts, one belt's going to go out, go out the belt, right? Mm -hmm. And then you're going to have a guy saying, I won now. I'm going to go up to a 147 possibly. That is because 140 is not really. Most undisputed is usually relinquish at least one. Really belt relinquish or, right go up in, or go up and wait. Yeah. Because they can't keep all the belts. So what's the point of staying here? I'm the guy. I'm going to have to fight a guy to get my belt back. No, I'm not going to pay the same fee for a belt I already won. So. There could be the situation where that all four belts could be available by the end of May. Exactly. Because the loser ain't gonna get no belts. He with the what happens to the loser, he might submit to be a mandatory for one of the belts. Then you have the three other belts, the other guy goes to 147. Then you can have a situation where that hey, it's all open now for tank or whoever else to get these belts now. Let's go clean the vision out. It's unique because you got everybody wanna do unifications now. We couldn't find this, Jorge. You know, so we get unifications. You get unique, unique situation with Floyd. You have a unique situation with Tank, who's obviously a star doing 300,000 pay per view buys. And you have this perfect storm right now that we normally probably would never talk about in this in this fashion if all these factors did not happen and then you add COVID. Yeah. I, I, I just, I, I guess I, I, I'm going to be curious how Floyd and Davis work this out where they're not going to prioritize belts. I, I, I'm going to, I'm fascinated by that, by that model. I want to see how that works. And, and 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 what happens to it at the end right there but I, for the most part as a casual fan and i'm putting myself on my casual fan shoes i'm looking for a belt if you're trying to get my attention to see like i mean it's one the thing cat, that's right I, that, that's I, the, I, that's I, the I, point I, I don't know i don't know how you do me it. i don't care but the casual person who don't follow boxing like I us know, and it's like yeah i know tank this but he's not fighting a, a, he's not a champion you know people are like he why he doesn't have a belt or he's not this guy, he's not fighting a champion. You know, the, the, the average person is like, yo, why am I watching a fight if he's that good? Well, most why? of that, like, 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 especially like my, my crawl. I mean, I, I look, I, I played I, my live domino stream show, folks. I play with a lot of domino players. A lot of these guys are boxing fans. A lot of them are casual boxing mm -hmm. fans. And the way they understand Tank Davis, and Floyd, you're listening. I'm sorry, my friend. He's got a belt. He's got a belt. They don't recognize him by social media. They recognize him because he's a, he's a belt. And they see him fight and he kicks ass. So you got him campaigning on 140. Please have him campaign at 140. I'd like to see him at 140. I want him to get a belt at 140. I want to go to 135 and fight TFMO, Ryan Garcia. I want, I want those guys to come up to him. I actually kind of like the idea of those guys figuring out the they're all jockeying for position. And to me, if Davis, if this fight for Davis comes out victorious and he ends up deciding this wants to stay there at 140, no matter what anybody says, that's a jockey for position. And it, and it doesn't, and it kind of reminds me, you have to go back. Trinidad beats De La Hoya. Trinidad goes up to junior middleweight, and everybody's chasing wherever that money's going. So where he's going, where the belts are that, going, I could, I they agree. all chased him all the way to middleweight. They chased his ass. I could see I, that. That's one scenario that I do agree on. That, so, so at this point, you're jockeying tank, position. Because Tank could, I could see potentially Tank being the money man as long as he keeps knocking guys out. Exactly. I mean, he is the money man, technically. If you do three, let's just, let's just take it out, put it out there on the table. You do 300,000 pay-per-view buys on your very first pay-per-view, and you sell out a, a basketball stadium. You are the money guy. Yep. You are the intro. That's exactly what Floyd did. His first pay-per-view against Gotti did 300,000 pay-per-view buys. Of course, Gotti was a star. Gotti helped carry that, but that helped Floyd cross over. You have yep. that You have that guy who was big in New Jersey, and you have the, the guy who's the boxer guy who everybody's following. Boom, cross over. Tanks that guy. So, yep. I, yeah, I agree with you on that. No yeah. doubt. Yeah, So I and, and, that, and that was the whole point from last episode. Right? The last episode we did with was talking about Haney. To me, you guys, you guys, you guys are in a crowded three-division tier. Just if all you need is just one to step out and carve out his own path, and you basically you're rejocking position for the next weight class because you're right, they're all going to get to 140. It just means it might happen sooner than than we would have we would have expected. And in a way, I kind of like that. Let you, me leave you, this nugget though with this though. If that happens, there's going to be people saying that duck that tank's ducking. No, I, no, I, I, no, no, no. I'm not saying that. There will be some idiots who will say that. Well, though. those TikTok idiots who basically when I have that conversation. <laughs> I'm right here, and I'm gonna tell you no, 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 no. No, you guys, you guys don't know enough about the sport, or watch enough boxing, or at least go back and follow the sport enough to understand that this is not the first time that a group of fighters will be jockeying for position. 
You can go all the way back to the early welterweight area arrows and stuff. We can talk about Hearn, May, you know, Leonard, all those guys. Everybody at certain points, they're gonna jockey for position within a weight class or two. It's just now you guys are employing social media and TikTok and all this other shit. At the end of the day, you take all that crap out, it's the same thing. They're just jockeying for position. So to me, Davis going to 140, he's beating Haney to the punch, where I think Haney should have done that. And at some point, you know, got fighters have to make the decision to get out of this scrum right now, this crowded mess of 126 to 135. Go to 140, guys, where I expected all you guys to fight each other anyways. Man, we went over. I don't care. This one is it's our show. Oh, this, this is this fun. It's this a is good fun. time. This is always a lot of fun. This is fun. Yeah. We're going to have to. We're going to call this one a, a, a do here. Every time we get muddied up into the details, and at, damn the sanctioning bodies for this, because this is the reason why we get into these damn conversations where we debate the debate of the bait to finally go right back to the main point again. Yeah, I know. That's, that, that, that's the thing about boxing, though. <sighs> so um, we're going to close off shop here with this episode. Um, damn, I'm pumped up. I know you are. Click on like and subscribe, and click on the bell notification for YouTube, and... We're going to get a schedule going, let you guys know when we're on streaming live on Sundays and Mondays, which is probably our boxing schedule. Same thing for Twitch, boxing now. Spotify, click on the follow button. And also, for our affiliate on Spangler Sports World, we're on channel 250 on the Zingo app in Canada. Shout out to our affiliates in Canada. Uh, for any other shows you want to check me out on, I am on Wednesday nights, 8 p.m. Central Time on Jump Off Live with my brothers, JD, Jeff, and Johnny Dangerous. Jump off live 8 p.m. Wednesdays. Jorge, what you got? Uh, here on Twitch TV, I have a live domino stream. It's called Live Dominoes. Uh, you can catch us there Wednesday at 8 p.m. We take that show on the road. We're, if you're in the Chicago area, PL Lounge, uh, 3456 North Pulaski Avenue. We will be streaming there at 8 p.m. Central. You can come there as early as 6 o'clock. Uh, enjoy the food. Enjoy the the ambiance over there and then we're back to the normal streaming schedule on thursdays and saturdays at 8 p.m at the uh at the tavern or la taberna all right so we're gonna be ending this show here man always fun to do this here all the time man we got uh oh my belt's about to fall off here you know talk about sanctioning bodies man you must have did something there about that jorge shout out to wbc because uh shout out to you guys wbc man yeah we 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 we, we know we could be hard on you guys we just want you guys to do better that's all it is because we're true fight fans and you know i thought if we didn't do what we do then you know then things would go on the wayside we know we're just we're consumers and we let you know we like the product and just help us out so shout out to wbc so hopefully we'll be seeing y'all in a couple of fights in the next few months here now we love simplicity yeah right it just it just makes things clear for us to <laughs> It makes the fighters. It makes it easier for the fighters to basically jockey position on each other in social media or face to face and cross promotional. It just it makes sense. Simplify things, guys. Yep. So on that note, fellas, we're gonna get, we're gonna get out of here. We'll be back for another episode soon. But for my man Jorge Papo, rocking his Papo sweater. Yep. I'm gonna start calling you Papo now. Yep. Shout out to uh, the La Familia Domino League, uh, running strong since 2013. COVID kind of took us out. Uh, last year, uh, kind of ended our season short mm -hmm. there. But uh, shout out to all my brothers out there and sisters that play the game with us in the league, 100 strong. And uh, I'm looking forward to getting this. Hopefully, the season kicked off this fall. Thanks for checking us out, people. If you didn't catch us live, catch us on the playback. But until then, Jorge, I'm that dude named Dave, and we're out of here. Out of here. Be safe, folks. Mm -hmm.